once again, it's Friday night. Welcome to Conversations with the Owl. We have Vitas Barzdukas, one of our writers in Night Owl Theater. Mike McGrainer and myself, directs and produces Night Owl Theater. We have the man himself, Fritz the Night Owl, host. And Christian Ellis is uh, the man running the technical behind the scenes. So thanks for joining us. And ah, fuck. Uh, I'm still I, glad I so- I'm still glad somebody wants to hear us. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks for joining us, and without any further ado, the man himself, Fritz the Night Owl. And greetings, good groovers, Earth people, 14 viewers out there in the darkness. Welcome to Conversations with the Owl, coming to you live on a Friday night from the Jazz Entertainment Megaplex and Pleasure Dome. Our host is Mike McGrainer, who's going to ask me a bunch of very embarrassing questions to which I will lie uh, immensely. So trust not what you hear. Mike, how do you follow that? I don't. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, as they say in Wayne's World, uh, being able to sit here with my childhood hero with one of our writers on the show, Vitis Barzdukas. Hello, Vitis. Hello. And Christian Ellis back there on tech. He does not have a mic, but every now and then you may hear a yep in the background. That would be Christian. So, um, I, I, I do, do want to ask, where's the Pleasure Dome? Where's, is that from your radio show? Is the Oh, that's on the planet Zontar. Where we are now. No, I, know, and, I understand, I understand uh, that, cause, yes. But, I mean, oh, did you ever use that on the radio? Did you ever? I think I used a variation of that on the radio. Yeah, it... it, it uh, that got past the censors, the Pleasure Dome? Oh, yeah. The, the, the censorship was pretty light. In the days, I w- it, w- it was uh, heavy duty if you got caught saying one of George Carlin's uh, seven words and the expanded version of that monologue. But other than that, uh, a, a, a thing like Pleasure Dome would have been a yawn with the FCC. <laughs> right. Well, you know, all of us hanging out here every Friday night now so far, I can tell you that the Pleasure Domes on planet Earth are nothing like the Pleasure Domes on Zontar. So uh, thanks for the invite, Fritz. Well, going back to, it's tough to remember a lot of the radio stuff because I started on radio in Columbus in 1959. And I'll let you guys do the math on, and and, and the radio thing went off in, I was on the radio nonstop from 1959 till 2010. So I don't know, how, I can't remember how many years that was, but I logged a lot of air time. And that's actually, uh, I think, last week we talked about uh, your jazz show. I think that's where the uh, 14 viewers in the darkness, I think that's where I first used that little part of the phrase. Gotcha. Okay. Nice. Nice. Well, I know earlier before our session started, you know, Vitas and I flew up here kind of early and uh, we were discussing um, our, you know, earthly interests and and comics and things of whatnot. And uh, I recently acquired a 35 millimeter pristine print of Tim Burton's Batman from 89. And I had told Vitus and Fritz that I had actually not really knew anything about Batman until that movie came out. I was about eight years old. But uh, when you were a boy reading comics, Fritz, were you a DC or a Marvel man? I was actually both. Uh, Comic books were a major part of our adolescent, all the kids adolescent, uh, growing up in entertainment. And so, uh, for example, the first time I ever heard of Stan Lee was way, way back in the days when he was uh, writing The Human Torch and uh, working on Captain America and all of those things. And yet, on the other hand, there was a D... Well, actually, there there was three major publications, uh, DC, Marvel which was called Timely Comics then, Marvel and Fawcett, F-A-W-C-E-T-T publications. Fawcett uh, published a lot of magazines, probably the most popular being Popular Mechanics. And uh, so I read uh, Popular Mechanics because that was about Captain Marvel, the original, real Captain Marvel, (laughs) 
that was the one he suggested we all read. So we did what the captain said. <laughs> Learned a lot about things I could never build. <laughs> and were you a fan of, uh, I know Batman was what got me into comics, and I never really got into comics. I was more into the media franchise tie-ins, so I watched the movies, the animated series, and things like that. But Batman was what did it for me. Were you a big Batman fan as a kid, or was it sort of he just one of the characters among? No, I, he he was he was one of my favorites because I liked the the darkness of what the original Batman was. He even used to carry a gun in the very very early days when I first started reading uh, Batman. So no, Batman was what was one of the biggies. When did they get rid of the the gun? Was that like with the comics code or oh that... no no way way before the comics code? I think around issue seven uh, around the eighth time he appeared in uh, um, Detective Comics or maybe his own. Anyway, the gun didn't last very long. Maybe five or six books. Okay, and then it vanished. Now, but in those in, the, in, the, in, the, in those days, the heroes were a lot more. Uh, violent than they are now. For example, cat in, in the ra- the serial, the Republic serial, The Adventures of Captain Marvel. There's one place where he throws a guy off the roof. Right. <laughs> and we all cheered. <laughs> <laughs> now, Vitus, you're a big comic book guy too. Like from from when you were a kid, did you? Were you? How was Batman for you? That's so oh, yeah, so I was I was more of a Marvel guy. Oh, okay. um, I grew up reading Marvel. I have two older brothers. And one of my older brothers, he's seven years older than me. And so I got all of his comics. I would read all of his comics. So I read a lot of Spider-Man, a lot of X-Men, um, a lot of Daredevil. Um, mm. I got into Frank Miller. He was, you know, became my favorite. And um, See, I surprised you when I told you there was a different Daredevil yes. in the 40s. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't even know. And so when you actually, uh, one time before a show, you gave me a laminated cover of daredevil and it was the old one yeah and you signed it for me and yeah um yeah i had no idea so um but to answer your question yeah i was i was a marvel guy and then i you know i just for me i guess i related more to the problems that the marvel characters had i related more to like peter parker um i like the stories better and i you know really it was whatever my brothers were buying you know, and then as I got old enough with my paper out money, then I then I started buying comics myself, and I never really got into DC. And the only ones I really know are the big hits, like you know, Superman and yeah. Batman. And you know. well, you guys had a lot more things to do, entertainment wise, than we did in the forties. Sure. I mean, we had comic books, movies, uh, the radio serials that were on, and uh, I lived in a town near the woods and the river, so we had the winter sports and baseball, football, all that stuff outdoors. And there just wasn't as much audio visual things to entertain us like they have now or when you were growing up. Right, sure. And I know, Fritz, I know what we talked uh, in an earlier episode about what became of your comic collection and the paper drives and everything and how we had uh, Amazing Fantasy number 15 out here that we found uh, and things like that. But did you... So a lot of your comics were lost when you were a kid, your collection that you had. The the, the biggest loss I had was when we, mo- when we moved from the Army Post just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. When we'd made that move... Somehow or another, my mother, so forth, and packing stuff, just left the comic books and the big little books. Most of them uh, stayed in with some kid in um, uh, Army Chemical Center. <laughs> and Vitus, did you keep all your comics, or are they gone? Oh no, I still have all of them. I have uh, fourteen long boxes of oh my god comics in my um, in my office right now that um, they're not they haven't all been graded but they're all in plastic with cardboard backing and I know that when I die my wife's gonna pay somebody 50 bucks to haul the shit out of there but um, <laughs> anyway so yeah so I got all my brother stuff um, so he would he collected stuff from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s yeah see back in the 40s reading comic books was one f stop above pornography right, sure, right. I mean yeah, they, yeah, the, right. the the power elite was really against them, and uh, we used to trade comic books. It was a, a, like on Saturday, it was comic book trading time. And the thing is, 
we didn't know that they would be valuable later on, so there were no plastic bags, there were no backing boards. I kept mine in a stack, unsorted, in a in a peach crate. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, I know, I, I when I got into comics, it wasn't even, I would pick up, they did a lot of, like, reissues and... and uh, I mean, they were none of them were original. I would buy them like in bulk at stores, where it was just like, "Here's a reprint of 25 historical comics." Yeah, and sure. So I read and Action the, Comics number one, and then there were those big oversized different. editions that they did. Yeah, for both Marvel and DC. Well, well, they had the ones where they teamed up. So it was like Spider-Man and Superman were together in one of the big. Yeah, ones. well, there was there was one where it was Superman and uh, Muhammad Ali. That's right. The, <laughs> yeah, there was. A book on that and there was also the incredible hulk versus batman right um there was that one um, i think superman and, and spider-man yeah had an adventure together but those are those big oversized books and i think they lasted about what two years something like that but i actually bought a bu- so i go to conventions periodically mm-hmm. <laughs> we have a we have a denzel washington movie interrupting us in the background and uh rosario dawson Looking all hot. Yeah, so I, I still go to conventions, and I pick up, you know, old ones. Um, and I just actually recently bought the Power Records. Um, did you ever have those, the Power Records? So what they would do is that they would take comics, um, like Fantastic Four, Captain America, Spider-Man, and what else did I have? Captain America, um, and the we, Hulk. We never had them on disc. No, but we, they but they had, would, they had they had on forty fives, and then you would you know put the record on and listen to it while you would read the comic. Yeah, oh, no, so I had no. Those. Were they like the floppy forty fives, like that were made out of like a thin? No, or were they like vinyl? Vinyl, yeah. Oh, okay. And then you'd put them on, and then I don't know if there was seventies, maybe Christian. Yeah. Yes, Christian is yes, first I'm, I'm over getting, there wanting yeah, to get yeah. in on this. Yeah. Well, a we we didn't have them because comic books were considered. Oh, um, oh and Denzel negative, does it again. A negative. Comic books are considered a negative force, and um, we we had no idea that someday they would be valuable. Right. Uh, as I say, I kept mine to just I'd buy it, read it, and put it in the uh, peach crate, and had a couple of peach crates full of them. So, that, so if you're like looking back at the comics that you did own, like remembering back, what were some of the more most valuable ones that you did have? I had. Uh, Captain Marvel, I had uh, the Batman Joker one, I had the Human Torch versus Submariner, Um, that was out of Timely Marvel, and uh, oh, there were were so many, because comic books were much more of a major entertainment than than they are now. Stop! Just a minute. I'm going to turn this off. Yeah. I had it on. I had it on pause. You know, and it shouldn't have come back on. By the time it hit Zontar, though, I mean, it just <laughs> yeah. Cable programming up here has. And they only cost off. a dime. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. But actually, in a way, uh, after World War II, a lot of the superheroes faded out. And at the same time, television was uh, growing. And on TV, oh, I, I guess in the mid-50s, the Westerns were the most popular. There was uh, Tales of Will Fargo with uh, Dale Robertson. There was, uh, uh, oh, a great one with, with Richard Boone, Have Gun, Will Travel. Mm. Love that one. And uh, there was uh, The Texan with Rory Calhoun. That was pretty good. And... Uh, well, there were just just a lot of westerns on television and in movies. Westerns were the big things, and superheroes were pretty much out of the picture, except for nerds like me. So now, yeah. So when when did you stop collecting comics? I stopped collecting comics, collecting them, probably. Well, in my day, if you were, I think I mentioned it to one of the other shows. In my day. If you were a male reading com- superhero comics or any kind of comic book, after ninth grade, uh, your masculinity was questionable. Right. It was just a thing. So I used to sneak into the... Because I liked a lot of the comic book artists, and I would buy characters I was indifferent to because I liked uh, the artwork. Uh, 
the uh, not Bob Kane who wrote Batman, but there was an artist Sperling, I think his name was. Okay. I forget. It wasn't Bob Kane, but there was a guy that did Batman just uh, incredibly in the forties. And you liked Wally Wood, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we talked about Frazetta in an earlier uh, right. episode yeah. and everything. Well, actually, a lot of the... Uh, see, in those days, artists didn't sign the, uh, their comic books. They weren't given credit for it. Uh, there were just a very, very few. Uh, Frazetta got got uh, printed, and, and he just used the name Fritz. And C.C. Uh, Beck, who did Captain Mar- the original Captain Marvel, the real Captain Marvel... He signed some, but most of the characters in, in Timely Fawcett or DC, I think Simon and Schuster and Bob Kane also got credit in the books. But for the most part, uh, writer and artist were not mentioned. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Have Gun Will Travel earlier. Is that the song they're singing on the railroad tracks in Stand By Me? When he's like, uh, they do the, was it the Paladin song or whatever? Like, I'm like, I think that's a theme song, isn't it? To have gun will travel, but well, I can't remember. I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. There's a well, channel, there, there's a long. channel low on cable that does carry all of those old westerns. Yeah, no. uh, yeah, I love westerns, my God. Um, so in '66, just out of curiosity, when Batman the series came out, the Adam West series, mm-hmm. you being a comic fan from being a kid. Were you insulted by the series, or did you have fun with it? Like what? I had fun with it. I thought it was just terrific that uh, they, while they didn't have the um, dark Batman that I preferred, they had the later Batman where there was a lot of humor inserted in, in silly stories. So it, it and, and of course Michael Keaton was terrific, and the costume was terrific, and Nicholson was Nicholson was the Joker right right off the pages. Love Nicholson's uh, Joker. Oh, in the eighty nine, yeah, 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 in in, in the original, and um, it, it it was uh, I forgot the point I was going to make. Oh, the Adam West series, just as oh yeah as, yeah like, the, the Adam how, the Adam West the, the Adam West series. Not only did I enjoy Adam West as Batman. I also enjoyed the really big stars that made guest shots on the show just to be just to be on the show. Uh, I, I think one of the old oh, one of the biggies was uh, Cesar Romero as a the, for, the Joker, wasn't Joker, he? The Joker, yeah, yeah. Joker. Oh, he was the Joker, right? Yeah, on, yeah. Well, on TV. Vincent Price was in it as a villain. Vincent uh, Price Egg was Egg in Man, it. Egghead. Yeah, a whole bunch of major league star right. movie stars were wanted to be guest guests on the bat the bat the Adam West Batman show. I one of my favorite parts of that show is when Batman's running around with a bomb. Oh that's the movie. That's the, is that the movie yeah, that's, and you know, yeah, he's running around like through the docks or you know, <laughs> We got and, a bomb. Right. And he's running around with a thing over his Oh thing. and another thing yeah. I liked was the, shark the yeah, yeah. W- w- was when on the screen it would say pow or zap right. or bam. Yeah. Right. You know w- w- with the comic book art that went in the comic books that went with the words blam, right, pow, etc. Well, what I love about that is it covers the whole screen so they don't even have to make a contact right. when you throw a punch, <laughs> right, right. you know. So, now did you like the comics? Did you like the comic book movies that have come out recently? Have you seen them? I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of the uh, Marvel ones and I've seen a lot of the DC ones. Um, and uh. There are some that, that that I like immensely, and then there are some I thought, gee, the writers of this never read the comic book. Yeah, sure, right. <laughs> and uh, so that's my <coughs> criticism, right. criticism there. Now, for example, the first Wonder Woman, the lady they got to play Wonder Woman, magnificent. Yeah, she's great. Although I would have liked the slightly heavier Linda Carter type on there. Uh, I thought the new Wonder Woman costume was terrific, but I'd have liked a little bit uh, more muscle on, but the lady's face, and she did it great. Uh, Gal Gadot, was that right? I've, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was it. And I, 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 I liked the movie. I think they stayed fairly close to the uh, comic book version of Wonder Woman, who had quite a few incarnations over the years, or changes, but that was the Wonder Woman that I remember from the 40s, and the Linda Carter series, so right. I was always a fan of Wonder Woman because there was a strange 
art, art, strange art in it by a guy named William Moulton, M O U L T E N. Anyway, uh, he was a major league teacher or writer or prof or was something. One that created? Did he, did he create Wonder Woman? Is that? Is I that think he. I think he did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, he, as, as I say, his art was. It was like. Um, Basil Wolverton, who did an incredible strip uh, called Space Hawk, and then he also did a lot of stuff for Mad Magazine. Um, as, as a matter of fact, he created the ugliest woman in the world for Little Labner called, um, uh, oh my goodness, I got her picture on the wall. Lena the Hyena. There we go. <laughs> that was Basil Wolverton and um, William Moulton were two artists that were completely unlike anybody else drawing comics. Gotcha. Nice. There was a guy called Mac Raboy that, uh, if, if you didn't know it was Mac Raboy because they could sign it then, uh, he, he took over Flash Gordon when Alex Raymond exited, and his style, you'd have thought that it was done by Hal Foster, Prince Valiant, or... Um, the guy I just mentioned, uh, the, uh, that that was big. Moulton? Or Mo no, it wasn't Moulton. Um, anyway, Mac Rabbit was one of the artists that uh, his master, his Captain Marvel Jr. master comics covers, many of them are just absolutely frame them, put them on the wall. They were just great. So when we started talking, we started hanging out, you showed me, You did you try to become a comic book artist or you submitted? Oh, yes. Yeah. And when I, when I was in grade school, I was what I wanted. I wanted to be a comic book artist who played the saxophone and also was in movies. <laughs> <laughs> Comics, jazz, and movies will all be covered in this episode. Right? Yeah. And then so... Did you try to copy your style off of somebody, uh, off another artist? Or yes, were you... Frazetta. Frazetta. Okay. And, uh, oh, well, people are still, artists are still being influenced by Frazetta. Sure. But Frazetta had a, he had a Hal, for, he had a Hal Foster and a Byrne Hogarth who did the Sunday Tarzan strip for many years and, and has written some books on art and anatomy and so forth. But he is another one of those incredible artists. And in the Sunday comics, they would give his Tarzan a whole full page. And so that's another name for you artists to remember. Bern Hogarth. Bern Hogarth. Now, did you, sub and then you submitted your art somewhere? I did. Uh, to all of the publishers, DC, Marvel, um, Fawcett, Dell, and there were a couple of others, and about the only thing I could say was they all sent back personal um, thank you letters for submitting, but uh, your hero is not quite up to the moral standards that a hero should have. My hero was kind of like uh, Han Solo. He did the right thing because any other choice he had would be, he, would be da too dangerous for him. And, and I used to always say, if I was Flash Gordon and I, and, and I saw uh, Ming's daughter, Dale Arden would have been history. <laughs> and uh, the, the Buster Crab, 1934 Flash Gordon, which was the first uh, one he did, the first Flash Gordon he did, absolutely stunning it's like they again buster crab they just it was like they pulled him right out of the drawings on yeah. the comic book terrific serial and well worth seeing what did you think about the uh 80s flash gordon with the queen soundtrack and i thought the uh settings and the and the uh special effects i thought i thought those were terrific but um who, I forget who, oh, Ming was great, but uh, Fl Flash Gordon and Dale and the print, the... Well, Brian Blessed is... Um, the, is now, I did like... Uh, Hawkman or the what? guy went on to, the guy went on to, he was a pal of Flash Gordon, but he went on to be a James Bond in about one or two movies. 
he was at, he was I think he did the two movies after after um, Sean Connery gave it up. But well, he only Sean did it Connery, twice. Sean Connery, Roger Moore, George Lazenby. Uh, I think it's I think it's Lazenby. Because he, he did he's Honor, Majesty, one. Secret Service, and it's one of the best Bond yeah. movies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. And then Max von Sydow played. Yeah, uh, uh, Max villain. von Sydow did one of the great movie villains was the original Ming the Merciless in the 1934 Flash Gordon series. And Which I, I think they cut into the movie Rocket Ship, right? Like they cut a bunch of the yeah, zeros together. and they, Yeah, Rocket Ship was a feature film where they took all 14 of the serial things were able to condense it into one continuous story. And uh, again, incredible. You still with us out there, movie listeners? <laughs> You're like, move on from comics. We love, but I know there's some comics, comic artists out there, and uh, yeah, Fritz is the man. Every time we get together, we discuss comics. He has endless stories to tell, and in future weeks, I'm sure we'll discuss comics again. But I do want to jump over to what everybody's waiting for: jazz music. Okay. I know you're waiting for movies. I'm just being cheeky, but uh, yeah, let's. Your time at the Jazz Channel uh, was only a fraction of your love of jazz. But I, when we arrived on Zontar today, you were playing jazz and uh, uh, some of your favorite artists and everything. Back in the day, did you ever get to attend jazz concerts? Did you ever see any of the big? big oh guys? yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I got to at the Ohio Theater. I got to MC the show where Herbie Mann who was uh, probably the jazz flutist is flutist flautist Altus. anyway the guy the guy played flute but he he was <laughs> he was he was a major league top of the line jazz artist very respected and, and uh, great flute playing um and oh did they ever send you to any like jazz festivals Oh, for example, I used to, I had a telephone telephone relationship with uh, my one of my favorite tenor sax players, uh, Teddy Edwards, and um, I met Nancy Wilson, and uh, m maybe I'll think of some more as we go on. But uh, I didn't meet as many jazz artists as I met. Oh, I met uh, Dave Brubeck and Paul Desmond. Oh, that's huge. Well, um, I didn't meet as many jazz artists as I met movie stars. Did you ever meet Buddy Rich? Oh, as a matter of fact, yeah, he was one of the ones. That, he was one of the ones that, as a matter of fact, uh, got together with him at two or three private parties, and uh, very funny guy, very enjoyable. I have heard so many stories about if he likes you, you're his best friend. Yeah. If he hates you, he is a complete prick. Right. Well, I've heard, I've heard those stories. All I can say is it was two or three parties my late wife and I went to after he did shows. As a matter of fact, he would come to Columbus and he did a couple of shows for high school in high schools, local high schools. Uh, and then, you know, he, he knew a lot of people in Columbus. They would have parties and he would go and my wife and I would go and other people, jazz fans were there. But a terrific guy. Yeah. So I'm going to ask, this is going to be a really dumb question, but how does one become like a jazz DJ? Um, do you, you obviously had a knowledge of jazz. Yeah, yeah. You know, before... Well, and, and the, the way you become a jazz DJ is back in my day, uh, jazz was a very, very big thing on radio and uh, uh, movies a lot of jazz background in the things. And on radio in the 40s, it was the big band era with Buddy Rich and Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman and Gene Krupa, all Harry James, all of these guys uh, appeared in movies. So, but the, but the way I became a jazz DJ was I was doing a regular DJ show and I mentioned to my boss I'd like to do an hour or two of jazz and he just said, go ahead. And, and was there it. was there an existing jazz hour at that no. time, or no? You just was the, this night owl jazz? No, the, they were the, This was way before night owl. Okay, and then you had full say in yes the programming and oh, play what I want, say what I want. And, and did you promote any jazz musicians that you 
maybe even were not famous at the time? Or? Well, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, we did have a Night Owl Jazz Club. Todd Barkin uh, w- knew a lot of jazz people, and he arranged with whatever movie theater is diagonally across from the old Ohio Union on um, on High Street. Okay. There was a movie theater there, a big movie, popular movie theater that became a place where a lot of they, they had an s- actual stage inside the theater and they had a balcony and it turned into a place where they had a lot of rock stars like uh, uh, would you're, come there. You're talking about the Newport Music Hall now. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It used to be called the Agora or the Castle, maybe. But the the yeah. Cleveland one's called the Agora now, but the one here was the Agora before it was Newport, right. and that is uh, that's it, the place. Okay. And anyway, it it, it was there, and um, they they had some some jazz. I forgot to mention we, we, uh, this group Todd Barkin uh, brought uh, and the Night Owl Jazz Club brought Stan Getz hmm. and Les McCann to Columbus. So those were the two shows uh, that we had. Okay. That's awesome. I, the only thing I know about jazz is when the Beastie Boys said, I'm Buddy Rich when I fly off the handle <laughs> and uh, sabotage. And so I looked up Buddy Rich, and I guess uh, he's well, the man drum- with hands so great, they almost disappeared when he played. Where- Drummer, drummers are still using a lot of Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa stuff from the 40s. I, I, when I was in college, I did a play. I did a um, pl- uh, Played Against Sam by Woody Allen. And he, oh, yeah. And he mentions uh, Thelonious Monk. Oh yeah, and I got to see Thelonious, I, and I got to meet Thelonious. Oh, I got to meet Thelonious Monk, Jimmy Smith, uh, oh, Dizzy Gillespie, and um, he had a uh, he had a big band. I can't think of his name. A major League big band, and the Ohio State Fair had three nights of jazz and I got to MC one of them which is where I met Monk and Gillespie and oh, wow, Jimmy okay. Smith and uh, oh I can't think so what of what was Thelonious Monk what was he like oh a terrific guy uh, he, he would talk to you like uh, again he'd known you for years and uh, uh, just a terrific guy all of all of them were really yeah. and uh, I can't remember a negative a negative, a negative star that I met that was not nice. Okay, I was uh, touring with a band at one point. We were in Brooklyn, I think, and there was a. I had always wanted to go to a jazz club. I hadn't been to a real jazz club, and I know uh, New York had a lot of like little, you know, places. And it was about, God, I want to say three in the morning. I don't know if it's legal to stay open, so it might have been before two. But we crept into this little jazz club, maybe the size of. You know, two of the rooms that we're in right now. Well, and they they used to have after hours jam sessions, which were very very common in uh, New York. Oh, okay, maybe that was what. But I just remember grabbing a cocktail and like sitting there, and I was mesmerized. And I had never been into jazz, like growing up or anything. I never appreciated jazz, and I sat there for what seemed like ninety minutes, maybe, and we just getting a little buzz on and listening to the jazz. It was one of the best experience, late night experiences of my life. And I was wondering if you ever got, I, I know you met a lot of these people when you were working, but did you ever get to kind of, you know, shoot the shit in conversation over drinks and a smoke with these guys off the clock? Some of them, um, Mel Torme was one. And, uh, I was just, Julie London was one. Uh, I just remembered that again, growing up in the forties, the big swing bands were the most popular music on radio. And one of my favorite big bands, and I think it was in the late 40s, was Billy Eckstein, who was A, a tremendous vocalist, and B, he had this big band that had people like Miles Davis and all kinds of people who went on to be major jazz stars. But another guy to listen to, Billy Eckstein. Great voice. Makes everybody else sound like a soprano. Right. <laughs> so so did you ever meet Miles Davis? Did you ever interview him? Uh, sadly, no. Okay. Hmm. There was a time when jazz swing, I don't even want to say jazz swing, cause, but I do you remember, like a, was it early 90s, mid 90s, where like swing came back for like two years? Uh, and it was Brian Setz Orchestra, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. I, I actually took swing lessons. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so my wife and I actually... When swing dancing like two years ago, or yeah. actually before the pandemic, 
Oh. Um, oh, so that recent. Yeah, so we we went there and um there's something for us to do, but we enjoyed it, but there's something about that's with swing, not not to take over the conversation, but with swing, I guess there is like a um an attitude of you if you're uh, people would go around and ask different people to dance. Yeah. You know, like, you know, mm-hmm. and my wife and I were there just to dance with each other. And so anytime the song was over, we'd grab our drinks and like face the wall or, you know, because my wife's like, I don't want to dance with some stranger. But the I guess the idea is that if you're asked, you get up and to dance and you learn different moves with different people. Well, actually, in, in the 40s and 50s, a lot of uh, very, very popular singers uh, would cross over into jazz and vice versa. If you listen to Sinatra, there's a lot of jazz in his music background Ella Fitzgerald Peggy Lee uh, Doris Day as a matter of fact there was one Dean Martin record which is one of my all-time favorite records called Ain't That a Kick in the Head right or in the movie the original seven with Frank Sinatra and that uh, he does that song and a great vibist is uh, the head of the band that he's singing ain't that a kick in the head mm. but i mean definitely a swing thing out of the 40s and 50s did you ever swing pardon did you ever swing did you ever go ever go swing dancing are we still talking about dancing yeah swing dancing yes <laughs> did you ever go swing dancing no no to to this day i'm a lousy dancer yeah a telephone pole and i would it would be a toss <laughs> as to who was better as to which was better <laughs> gosh i think one i would great... dance the slow ones with my wife right but uh, the slow ones were really great. They, I mean, they were romantic, and uh, you would fall in love slow dancing to sure. one of the great uh, right. songs from those days. Yeah. We will uh, we'll transition out of this in just a second, but I do want to say uh, when that swing kind of came back for a little bit with the bands, like Cherry Pop and Daddy's and all right. bands, uh, I was all in, and my brother was all in, and we were all getting it. And then I feel like maybe it was two years and then it was not cool again. Well, I mean, it was I, like a very quick drop off. If you ask me, what happened was it was kind of cool because Swingers came out. The movie Swingers came out. Oh, I think they kickstarted it. You yeah. know, whatever. And then they did it in the Super Bowl halftime show. Oh, I remember that. And I remember suddenly you didn't want to be a. Maybe that's that was just my perception. But right. suddenly you didn't really want to be a part of it anymore because right. now it became. It wasn't like a little. Th- cool thing anymore became maybe just too popular or now do you remember this fritz because well, you were well, still a dj when this swing kind of came back at the in the oh yeah well 2000s. i all, all the way through my jazz thing i integrated swing into in, into the show because i thought sw- i would do some dixieland also but uh it, it occurred to me that there are tons of movies a lot of them Musical director was Quincy Jones, but uh, there is a lot of jazz as background music in tons of movies even today. Yeah. And by the way, this my history could not be correct, listeners. So I don't know if <laughs> don't get mad, but I that's the way that I remember it. So yeah, 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 no, I'm just well, I was just curious because I know that it was it was neat to feel. I remember when I first heard Dave Matthews Band when I was like 14 or 15. And uh, that Under the Table and Dreaming had come out, which was their second album for the purists out there. But anyway, it was the first major label thing. And I remember hearing a song of theirs being kind of obsessed at the time. Uh, I will defend that. They're great musicians. Uh, but right. but I remember going, this is jazz. Because I didn't know what jazz music was. And because they had horns in the band. Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, a yeah. saxophone and a clarinet, whatever. But I mean, I just remember buying that CD, being obsessed, and then wanting to get into jazz. So funny enough, Dave Matthews Band was my gateway into <laughs> wanting to find jazz sure, music, yeah. which, you know, jazz people will tell you they are not jazz. But well, you know, just. And this is the wrong thing, but a big name rock band had a jazz sound to it. I think it might have been Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Anyway, one of the, one of the guys, the, the singer for the group, went on to become a single singer uh, a star on his own. Okay. But I, I think it was Blood, Sweat, and Tears that had a little bit of jazz worked into their arrangements yeah. and so forth. And as I say, drummers today are still using the Gene Krupa uh, thing from... Uh, Sing, sing, sing. Do you mean like the technique? A certain well, it's a a, a rhythm. Okay. That 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 they do, and and as a matter of fact, uh, today they are still using things from the jazz score from the TV show Peter Gunn, which had a 
completely all jazz background, and he went to a jazz club regularly. That's where his girlfriend was. Terrific TV a detective series called Peter Gunn. Oh, it's right. a terrific theme. That theme is iconic. So I don't know if you were telling me a story where, I don't know if it was the drummer for... Was it Dave Brubeck? I don't remember who it was, but they were sh- they're teaching a class on. Oh, that was yeah, Joe Morello, who where, was the drummer for Dave Brubeck. Can you tell that story where he was sh- he was teaching time, right? Or he, well, he was doing a guest shot at Van's Music Store, which was on High Street between Oakland Park and Dunedin, and um, big big music store. As a matter of fact, that's where I got my tenor saxophone. Anyway, he was doing a, um, a clinic there. And at the end of his demonstration of doing things, uh, somebody asked him, what's the most important thing you have to know as a drummer? And, and he said, well, it's learning how to keep time. And then he went on to do four different time signatures at the same time. One with his right hand, one with his left, one with his right foot, one. Right. And he did four time signatures all at the same time. And... Yeah. Uh, Oh my god. That's terrific. Right. Oh my god. Yeah. Joe Morello was the guy's name. Wow. Well, we have about 20 minutes left tonight, but I will transition this. We went from comics to jazz music and now let's let's give our listeners a little bit of a fun night owl movie movie stuff. So, one of the lines to transition this is uh uh in our House on Haunted Hill episode in 2011. This was January yeah. 2011. You had a great line. Uh, a woman was hanging from the balcony in House on Haunted Hill, and you're in the painting in the hallway. Yeah. And you say, uh, let it be said that I love to hang with women who swing. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is the transition. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and that was all ad lib. <laughs> it is my favorite. It's probably, out of all my years of watching Night Out and everything, my favorite joke that you had written. Uh, well, because, House on Haunted Hill was the first movie. No, no. Well, it was number, episode four for It was us. early, yeah. And that was... Where did we where did we show Night of the Living Dead? Oh, that was Grandview. Was that our a Grand View? Oh, that, yeah. that was our Night first. Night of the Living Dead was the very first. That was our first one. Well, yeah. House on High Hill was the first one where like uh once we uh, got the bugs out, I got the beginner bugs that for me personally as a director and producer, I had, House on Haunted Hill was our oh, this is a perfect episode moment. Where like we kind of got the hang of what we were doing. Mm-hmm. You're on screen more, you're on screen of five breaks instead of three. Um and and it was just a, a such a tight thing. You were still writing the show at the time before Vitas came along and said, "I'll take it from here." I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. He did not. <laughs> but but uh, but no. But uh, yeah, you were still writing the show, and I just remember you. you I never knew what you were going to say at that point. Well, my writing the show was actually just making notes. So that when and and I would have idiot cards that we would paste up on some sound boom or something, but I could only, and we're talking eight by 10 sheets of white paper, and I could only do five of them for any movie. Right. And, and um, but, 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 but I, as I say, I use those as uh, what we used to call cue cards or idiot cards. Right. And it's funny too, because when you look at Fritz's cue cards, if you're just a normal person that's not hosting the show, you almost he writes like almost like code in them that only he would understand abbreviations very shortened like ftno is fritz the night owl of course but he'll just sort of shorthand so it could be five cards but it could actually be a full two minutes and it but was, on the cards neat. on the cards i would put things that i wanted to make sure that i said in the ad libs and on the channel 10 show the breaks, as far as John Haldy was concerned, say what you want, play what you want, just be done at six in the morning right. when we sign on again. Right. So there were no cards on Channel 10, right? It was just you, almost like a radio DJ, no, it, it, living, it, it, right? I had, I had a 8 uh, by 10 note card that sat at the bottom of one camera that I could see that to make sure that this particular point about the movie or something about got into what I was talking about. Okay, I, gotcha. I, yeah. I'm very forgetful, and it, it's I just there were some things I wanted to make sure I said, so I'd write them down. So, did you ever use a teleprompter on Night Owl, or was it just cards? It was it was just cards. Oh, okay. Teleprompter was very new when I was do when I was doing Night Owl. Um, 
so I didn't, I didn't use teleprompter until we got in the 21st century when Mike would set up uh, interviews on um, the different TV news shows and they would have the teleprompter of what my cues would be and I used it. So then like this was the age before the internet. So what did you how did you research like all the films and all the act like in what did you decide to ch- like to focus on for the breaks? Well, it would de- de- it would depend on the movie we were showing. I would handle the Bowery Boys visit uh, Dubuque differently than I, than I would handle the diary of Anna Frank. Well, sure, yeah. So um it was and there were like the Leonard Malton book was I would always start there, and then I had other reference books on the stars and the movies and so so there was plenty of printed material okay. out there to, to and I did research them and I would m- mark down the things I wanted to make sure I said. Okay, I just saw last night uh, about three days ago a movie called Storm Warning, and it has Doris Day and Steve Cochran in it, and just a terrific movie, but Doris Day is sort of a supporting actor in that, and Steve Cochran, a great movie villain, he has, well, he was, in that movie, he's above the title, but it was like Ronald Reagan was an investigative reporter, and he really did a great job in that movie. It was a movie about uh, the Klan in uh, the... Oh, I guess early, late 40s or uh, early 50s. Storm warning. Storm warning? Yeah. And throughout these episodes as we go, you'll hear Fritz uh, mention movies that were influential to him in his life or when he talks about the title and everything. Make note of these because uh, this will be your, your film 101 as we continue to go uh, further into uh, Night Owl stories. Next week, we're actually going to be talking about uh, Night Owl Theater and Channel 10 uh, for our mid-season uh, episode, and that's going to be something that uh, I know all of you have been waiting for. We've kind of led up to that, and we're going to be talking about the glory days, the 70s and 80s of Night Owl Theater. And uh, But we still have about 15 minutes together tonight, so uh, continuing onward, Fritz, I know that uh, on the Channel 10 days. Uh, well, I guess, you know, when we were shooting our newest series, we'll finish out with that. But um, your your ad-libs and things, when you would write your cards or you'd have the jokes that you would play, and I know sometimes you kind of deviated and you would just say something that came to mind and it always was like the best stuff. When you did radio or TV or anything and you ad-libbed, did you ever find that, like, um, when you had pre-planned what you were going to say... No. Did you ever get a bug where you're kind of, I'm going to go this way now? No, it was like every show, radio or TV, it was either the muse was with me that night and I was able to come up with uh, all kinds of things at the spur of the moment uh, and the nights that the muse wasn't with me, <laughs> it was, you're watching Night Owl Theater, we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever, of course, back in the day when it was live, <laughs> and you knew that there's like not really any repeats because every time you repeated a movie, even if you said similar things, you were still there doing it live for that yeah. repeat. There was never a true repeat where it was captured and then re aired. Correct. So on the so, nights where the muse wasn't with you, were you just like, oh, screw it. It's never going to, no one's ever going to see that again anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh the, mu- the music was always there. But as I say, oh no, the muse. I mean, just like oh, on the, the muse, nights yeah. where, where you're like, well, I, I just crap take, this one today. Yeah, <laughs> just, just, just take care of business and let the movie run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. So that's that's the thing I know. Well, every, which by the I way, say yeah. every visual and every commentary related in some way to the movie, and uh, I felt that that was one of the main things a movie host had to do. And speaking of that, for example, in today's radio and television... I did you, not know it thundered in space. You could uh, <laughs> you could not be a disc jockey like we were in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and uh, a show like Night Owl Theater just doesn't exist anymore, so I could not get a job as the Night Owl or a disc jockey. Yeah, well, that see, that's the thing is I think the neat thing about your life is... You were born and lived through times where you literally got to see 
pre-technology and now into the newest technology and how the formats changed and how um, just being able to witness that and be part of TV at the time where you were allowed the freedom that you had. I mean, I can't imagine. So if you were born 20 years ago and you were wanting to get into TV now, I can't imagine how stale it would almost be because there isn't a whole lot of creative. I mean, there's a newscaster, there's a weatherman, but there's nothing that's really like nothing new that you can create. Yeah, well, you know, if he goes on public access, you know, the public access is well. Uh, yeah. That's still uh, if you grew up in Columbus, you know that public access was shut down. Due Nobody to people kind of went a little far. With uh, it, yeah. <laughs> there would not have been shows like Flippo, Lucy's Toy Shop, right. Casper the Camel, yeah. um, Nick Clooney's Dead. George Clooney's dad did a show on Channel 4 for two years. Yeah. Um, there just wouldn't have been show, shows I, like, there aren't shows like that on, local shows like that on the air today. So I, I was interviewed for, um, it was public access, it was a, a show that was in Dayton. And we were there, and we as we were all, looking at all the other people that were being interviewed, we realized that public access was the YouTube before YouTube where basically you could show different types of films, different types of projects, different types of, um, you know, th th you know, material, yeah. and it was just like YouTube. Yeah, I got, I got interviewed a number of times on public access. Yeah. And there were a couple of shows I watched. One of them was a guy that did art, and uh, another one... Uh, Another one was taken off the air because they thought he was a little too much into the um, occult language oh. and um, morals. That well, I they, know. They it, I mean, had. there's our friend Damon Zex, who uh, oh, that's who, who I was thinking of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Damon. Damon is a is an artist, uh, and he's still around. I see him out at concerts every now and then. Um, and then there was Angsto the Clown, and I heard that he was the one that sort of got it. Like he went a little far, and I think that that was kind of the they, between Angsto and Damon, it was sort of a, these were guys who saw, oh, there isn't really rules, and we can kind of public access, yeah. we can fully express, and unfortunately, uh, Columbus was not having it. So yeah. I, I, I knew I knew Damon, but I and knew Damon and listened to him, but I never, uh, I guess Angsto the clown came on later in uh, the life of public. Uh, TV, so uh, so I missed his show. Was yeah, he, was, he, was he like a bozo? Like, kind of like I mean, he had a you know the red clown nose. He didn't paint himself up or anything, but he had like a I, I want to say from my memory like a Shriners hat on, you know, or something. Okay, and right, then I read, right. but he would always smoke a cigar. And and I mean, I felt like the show existed to push the limits of censorship. No, one of the so one of the best awesome. shows on public service was an interview show done by a guy named Larry Levine. Okay. And he would have like if there were if there was a major league athlete or movie star or recording star, they would end up doing a Larry Levine uh, I interview. And, okay. So were you on that show? Oh, I was on that show a couple of times. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Larry was actually in the printed T-shirt business. I guess. He was the main man. I forget what the name of the T-shirt company was. But he actually did the printing on the very first Night Owl T-shirts and sweatshirts that oh. went out. Oh, and, nice, yeah. Yeah, and I went out to his, his uh, where they made them and saw how they did it. That's cool. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I just, when we got our last round of, of shirts printed up for Night Owl for the uh, Lost Boys at the Ohio Theater earlier this year, um, Mojo Sports Gear is what we use. Jeff Frino's company over there, and it was amazing to see the silk screening process is like a giant industrial machine yeah. where every color has its own screen, and the shirts literally rotate to the color mm -hmm. that I, I was amazed watching it. And like you know, if it's a heavy white, then it's, it gets two coats. If it's you know, and it's just kind of neat watching. I mean, it's so quick. And they yeah. throw it into the oven, pretty much, and then it just goes through the dryer, and that's the that so, shirt is done. So you know you're wearing the you know a Fritz shirt with yeah. Fritz's image on it. Yeah, uh, you, artist Joel Robinson actually. Did so that. Fritz, do you ever does it ever get old, like looking at somebody who's wearing a T-shirt with your face on it? Oh, it, it's very very flattering, and it's I say, well, my 
Andy Warhol, 15 Minutes of Fame, is still out there. Right, right. And right. this T-shirt wearer is um, helping promote it and, and keep the image Well, I just think it's alive. wild, like, going to, when we used to go to Horror Hound, I have to pronounce that, Horror Hound, that, you know, and then seeing people from, you know, not just from Columbus, but from all over the place wearing those T-shirts. Yeah. And I'm like, that's wild that, because you're sitting, you know, at the table signing autographs or just meeting people and all these people are wearing t-shirts with your face on it well a lot of a lot of times those those people either know somebody in columbus who sends them a t-shirt as a gift or they lived in columbus and moved somewhere else and then somebody in oh like in san francisco uh, seattle person a would see person b wearing a night owl shirt and person b was from columbus right and person a would say hey well where'd you get the shirt and are you from Columbus, et cetera, et cetera? I'll never forget. I was at uh, where Rome Maynard, one of our writers, lives uh, in South Carolina, and I went to um, I'm drawing a bl- Carowinds Amusement Park, and I rode the new coaster. It's right on the North Carolina South Carolina border, and I had a night owl shirt on. This was maybe five years ago, and somebody coming out of the park stopped me and said, "Fritz the night owl. Oh my God, you're a little far from." Ohio, and I was like, well, did you grow up in Columbus? And they grew up watching you. And then, I mean, I'm in North Carolina, and they, you know, well, get my, stopped. And- my two brothers are in the service. My older brother was in the Army. My younger brother was in the Navy. And a lot of times they would see, you know, when people weren't wearing the uniform, they were just in their regular re- relaxing clothes. Yeah. And he, they would see night owl T-shirts, and they would go up and start a conversation that's so them. great do, do christian do we need to close the window <laughs> that's what I'm over there. I'm windows oh. windows on zontar it does, sorry, it does. actually uh we are we are getting an advisory on the zontar weather that says uh <laughs> storm is rolling in i don't know if you guys can hear that in the background and that it's apparently going to last a few weeks so we may just camp out in sleeping bags with fritz and watch movies and then over the next couple weeks i mean we you know it may, may just be all updated on Fritz's greatest hits here. So water, uh, A watertight yeah. tent is what you need. When I was in the Army in basic training, they sent us out into the woods for a week, and I got, we each carried half of a tent with us in our backpack, and my buddy and I, there would be two guys per tent, and we got canvas that leaked. Mm. And so, I mean, sleeping... In the in the wild and having a, having to avoid drip. the drip 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 was uh, a major league annoyance. Yeah, sure. Well, Fritz, I know we're only together on Friday nights for this broadcast, but it looks like Vitus and Christian and I will be holed up with you over the next few weeks while the storm uh, while we wait the storm out. In that case, next week when we discuss Night Owl Theater in the heyday and the glory days, and we have a storm behind us. Right. This could make for a great double chiller discussion. So, to take us out of this this week's episode, could you say it was a dark and stormy night, <laughs> and then add whatever you want to it, just to make our listeners curl up, hold those covers a little bit tighter before they go to bed tonight. It was a, it, <clears throat> it was a dark and stormy night, and the boys were gathered in the Malamute Saloon. Excellent. Well, before we get blown away by this storm here, we're going to sign off for this week. But join us next Friday night, same time. Same same podcast. Thanks again for listening. See you.